Yo, 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 yo! How y'all doing? Good morning! Welcome to the bridge. So glad you're here today. That was kind of fun having the lights on during the video because I can never... When these lights are on, I cannot see any of your faces. Like, sometimes people will be like, oh, you were staring right at me during the message. And I'm like, no, I literally cannot see anything unless I'm down here like this. So I'm not bringing conviction if you think I'm looking at you. But it's kind of fun to see your faces. Are y'all feeling okay? Give me a little shoulder roll. Let's loosen up a little bit. I saw some somber faces. I saw some tired faces. I get it. Give me a little head roll. Oh, yeah, let's loosen up, let's loosen up, let's loosen up. If you're ready for the message today, say, I'm ready. If you're ready for the message today, say, let's go. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look ready. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I love you just as much, even though I did not turn to you first. I love making that joke every single week because every single week people laugh at it, and I do not know how, but turn to your neighbor, the other neighbor, and say, you look ready. All right, we are in part four of a series today called... Windy, y'all got it. If it's your first time today, you're like, Windy? No, 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 no. The series is called Windy. It's spelled the same way as Windy, but the series is called Windy. And this series is all about finding God's purpose for your life, or maybe his next purpose for your life, being used by God to make a difference in the world. It's called Windy because Getting to the place where God is using you to make, it to make a difference in the world is oftentimes not an easy path. It's often a long and windy path. The people that God uses to do some big things in the world are people generally who are able to make the right decision after the right decision after the right decision and stay on God's long and windy path with the ups and the downs and the lefts and the right, the highs and the lows to hang in there until God brings you to the place where you are meant to be. Through this series, we're looking at the life of a guy named Joseph. Everybody say Joseph. Joseph was a guy who had a big purpose for his life. God used him to save a nation from starvation and to bring healing to his immediate family, which, by the way, was a super messed up family. But Joseph was used by God for those purposes, not because he had some brilliant strategy or plan or because he was really smart or really gifted or really talented. He was able to do those things just because on God's long and windy path that he had Joseph on, and it was a long and windy path. He just kept making the right decisions. So through this series, we're learning how to make decisions the way Joseph made decisions, and he made decisions way different than me and you are so often tempted to make decisions. So each week of the series, we're looking at an episode of his life and a challenge or an obstacle or a trial that he faced that could have gotten him off the long and windy path, but he was able to stay on the windy path and be used by God. I'm going to catch everybody up in a minute on what we've learned so far in the different parts of his life, but let me introduce to you the specific thing we're talking about today. Today, we're talking about a temptation that each one of us so often feels on the long and windy path to God's purpose for our life. And if we get this wrong, if when this temptation arises, we make the wrong decision or a series of bad decisions, it will knock us off the path. We'll never be used by God for the things he wants to use us for. But if we can learn to overcome this temptation, God can use us for some big things. Here is the temptation we're talking about today. It's the temptation Joseph faced, and it's the temptation that so many of us face every single day. Some of us, whether we realize it or not. If you're ready to see it, say, I'm ready. Here it is. The temptation to write a story where we get the what? Glory. To write a story where we get the glory. To live our lives, to write the story of our lives with the goal of glory for ourselves. Now, glory is a very churchy word. And you're like, I'm not trying to get glory. Was like a, my night of the round table or something? I'm not trying to get glory. Here's what I mean by glory. I mean living either partially or completely motivated by winning the approval, respect, affirmation, accolades of the people around us. Living, wanting people to like us. For so many of us, one of the main drivers of our life is trying to live up to the standards, live up to the approval, win the attention, win the affection of the people around us. Sometimes it's somebody in your family. Like some of you are a slave to trying to live up to the expectations of a spouse. 
Some of you are still trying to live up to the expectations your parents put on you. Some of you, your parents have passed away, but deep down inside, you're still trying to live up to your parents' expectations. Some of you, you're trying to live up to the expectations of a boss or a coworker, a friend, a family member. Some of you, it's your child, and you are so focused on wanting people to like you, approve of you, give you attention. When I say write a story where we get the glory, that's what I'm talking about, living for the approval of other people. Now, this looks a little bit different depending on who you are. Like, we want glory for different things. Some of us want to write a story where we get the glory based on the amount of money we make. Like, you want to be known, even though you wouldn't admit this in church or probably anywhere else, but you want to be known as somebody who's successful in the business world, retire early, make a bunch of money, etc. Some of us, again, that we wouldn't admit it in church or maybe anywhere else, but we want to be known for, we want to be seen for, we want to receive affirmation and attention for how we look physically. Being an attractive person, being handsome or being beautiful or hitting the gym and getting those biceps real big, right? We want to be known for having a rockin' bod. We wouldn't say it because it's so, like, kind of embarrassing to admit, but for some of you, that's one of the main drivers of your life is wanting to be seen as attractive. If some of you are like, no, that's not me because I'm super unattractive, but for some of you, the fact that you, it really weighs on you, that you feel unattractive, means that one of the drivers of your life is looking attractive. Does that make sense? We don't always find pride in things that we think we're good at. Sometimes we're a slave to something we feel like we're not living up to. Some of us want glory for the way we parent, like you are enslaved to wanting to be seen as a good parent, either by your kids or your family members. Some of us, we want to get the glory for having like a charming personality, like a people person, a social butterfly, a confident person. Some of us want the glory for like a particular skill, like maybe you're really into your job and you're like, I'm never going to be famous, but I want to be known for being a great programmer or a great teacher or a great technician, a great mechanic, whatever it is. And you want to be seen in these ways. Some of you, and I've been there, some of you want to be, get the glory for being a good Christian, you want to be known for how much Bible you know, how much prayer you know, how much, you, how much prayer you do, how much you serve at church. And you are trying to write a story where you get the glory for being this amazing, super Christian, right? We've all been there. Every single one of us at one time has been there. Some of us are very aware of it. Some of us aren't. Some of us feel about this different ways, but it's been there for all of us. Now, let me take this one step deeper. Watch the thing that you want to be known for, you want to receive attention for and affirmation for, but even more than that, why? What's underneath it? Because this may be different depending on who you are. Some of us face the temptation to write a story where we get the glory out of a certain amount of self-importance. Like just pride, arrogance, I'm the man or I'm the woman and I want people to see that I'm the man or I'm the woman. You think highly of yourself and it feels good for other people to think highly of you. Boom, 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 boom. You live for your own glory. Oftentimes, though, that's not actually what's underneath the desire to win the attention and admiration of other people. Sometimes it's not self-importance that tempts you to write a story where you get the glory. Sometimes it is self-protection. You fear that if people don't like you, you will not be safe. If people don't like you, you will not be able to keep your job. Or if people don't like you, you won't be able to be promoted. Or if people don't like you, maybe you'll be single forever. Or if people don't like you, nothing wrong with being single forever, but some of you want to be married and you fear that you'll be single forever. Some of you, it is driven by this thought of like, if I don't have people like me, I'll just be rejected and alone, etc. Sometimes it's self-protection that wants to win the affirmation and attention of other people. And sometimes... At the very bottom, it is self-loathing. Some of you, since childhood, have been walking with a message that you do not have value, that you are worthless, that you have no purpose, that you're rejected and forgotten. And some of you received that message from a parent some of you received that message from a circumstance, your little child mind, that's all that you could internalize from growing up in a broken situation. And ever since then, you have been trying to get people to love you because you loathe you. You feel worthless and alone and the desire, whether you're succeeding or failing in your own eyes, to get the affirmation and attention of people is driven from a place of brokenness. 
Today we're going to talk about how to leave all this behind. I want that so badly for you. And God wants it so badly for you. Whether it's driven by pride or fear or self-hatred, my hope, my prayer is that by the end of this message, you'll say, I want to leave that behind. And maybe you won't know exactly how. Maybe you won't see like, you know, one, two, three steps of how to get there, but you'll say, I want to stop living a life enslaved to trying to win the approval of another person. The boss, the coworker, the mom, the dad, the husband, the wife, the child, sometimes the imaginary critic in your head. Say, I want to stop living for my own lifting up. I want to be done with that. I want to be free of that. That's what God wants for you. That's what we're going to talk about today. How do we quit writing a story where we always have to win that affection from other people? How do we find ourselves free of self-importance, free of the desire for self-protection, free of that self-loathing? That's what we're going to learn from this next episode of Joseph's life. If that sounds good, say sounds good. You can say it quiet. Oh, you said it loud. Great job. This is heavy. I know some of you are really feeling this right now. There were some people crying after first service because God was doing something in their life. It was not from my preaching. Let me tell you, it was not from my preaching, but people were feeling something. So if you're feeling something right now, God is working. He is speaking to you. He is wanting to bring something up and out of you in this message. Let me catch everybody up on what we've been talking about from Joseph's life, and then we'll look at the particular situation where he finds himself in this same situation. He finds himself in a moment where if he was anything like me and you, he would have been tempted to write a story where he got the glory. And he would have been tempted by self-importance, self-protection, and self-loathing, but he chooses something different. And we're going to learn to make that same choice. One more time. If you're ready, say I'm ready. ready. All right, so quick recap of Joseph's life. If you're new today, let me tell you what we've seen so far. Joseph was the youngest child of a big family. Lots of brothers, and they all hated him because he was their dad's favorite. Their dad made him this beautiful coat of many colors, and he, though he was the youngest, which would oftentimes be in some ways the least important person of the family, his, their, all their dad loved him. This got even worse when Joseph had a dream that someday the entire family was going to bow down to him. This dream, we find out, was from God, and it probably was a dumb idea that he shared it with his family. But he does share it with them, and they go, who do you think you are trying to lift yourself up above us? And that begins the long and windy broken path that Joseph has to walk down. Let me show you through these panels what we've seen. But as we go, I want you to be thinking about all the different ways Joseph, just like me and you, might have been tempted to want to win the affection and affirmation of people based on what he actually did in his life. For example, at the very beginning of the story, we see his brothers hear about that dream where he says he's going to be ruler, and they take him, and they sell him into slavery. He goes to the house of this guy named Potiphar, but what does he do? He starts at the very bottom of Potiphar's you know, uh, org chart and works his way all the way to the top. Right in episode one of his story, there's reasons for him to say, I'm the man, I worked my way up, I'm a self-made man, etc." There's room for him to want to bring himself glory in the next episode too because Potiphar's wife, his boss's wife, tries to seduce him and he does the right thing. He says no to her, runs from that situation and it actually lands him in prison. Again, he could have said, I'm the man, I said no to this temptation, I'm doing the right thing no matter what it costs me. Last week we saw him in prison and these two dudes show up who had been formerly working for Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, the cupbearer and the baker. And they have these dreams from God and Joseph supernaturally performs a miracle and gets the interpretation of their dreams. He says, hey, your dream, baker, means you're going to get killed in three days and your dream, cupbearer, means you're going to get restored to work for Pharaoh in three days. And both of those interpretations end up being exactly right. So now he's got the potential to want glory for being able to do a miracle by the power of God. Lots of reasons, lots of data points for him to say, this is all about me, I'm the man, give me glory, give me respect, give me affirmation. Now last week we left him in the prison. These two, this guy gets killed, this guy, the cupbearer, ends up going to work for Pharaoh. And that's where we're going to jump in today. Joseph's in prison. The cupbearer is working back for Pharaoh. Two years go by, and here's what happens. Pharaoh has a dream. 
It's the weirdest dream. We're not going to go into it in detail. But it's got all these cows and heads of grain. And there's these skinny, shriveled up cows who eat these big, healthy cows and then stay shriveled up. And then there's these shriveled up, dying heads of grain that swallow up these healthy heads of grain, but then they stay shriveled up. Pharaoh wakes up after this dream and goes, that felt significant. I think God or the gods, whatever's out there, I think was trying to tell me something. So he goes to all his wise men and enchanters and astrologers and says, I had this dream. Can you all tell me what it means? And none of them can. None of them know. They're all struggling. They didn't know how to interpret it. And then the cupbearer gets in the mix. And the cupbearer goes, oh. And he thinks back to when the cupbearer had been in prison with Joseph. And Joseph gave him that interpretation that he was going to get freed three days later. And the cupbearer turns to Pharaoh and says, I got a guy for you. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got a guy. He says, I got a guy for you, Pharaoh. And this guy's name is Joseph. So they go find Joseph in the prison. They trim his beard. They give him some new clothing. And they bring him to Pharaoh's court. Now picture how you would feel if you were Joseph in this situation after just going through all of the junk I just described, all of the highs and lows and the windy path and doing the right thing again and again and again and again, he finds himself suddenly in the palace on the mountaintop. Everything's working out and here's what Pharaoh says to him. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. Nobody has what it takes to help me in my situation." Nobody can figure this out. Nobody can make it happen. But I have heard it said of you, Joseph, your reputation precedes you. You've got some gifts I've heard about. You've got some abilities. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I've heard you got what I need. Now, again, imagine you're Joseph after all that struggle. If he's anything like me and you, he's feeling all the same things me and you feel. Maybe he's feeling a certain amount of self-importance. Yeah, Pharaoh, I am the man. I am the guy you need. You would not believe what I've been through. You would not believe how hard I worked. I worked so hard and raised myself from nothing to be second in command. I've done the right thing again and again and again. I've done some clean living, and now God is using me to do miracles. And I was doing miracles in the prison two years ago. And yes, Pharaoh, I'm your guy. There could have been that pride that would rise up in him. There might have also been some self-protection because he's thinking, if I can get Pharaoh on my side, maybe I'm not going to end up back in the dungeon. Maybe I'm not going to be stuck down there. Maybe the Lord will bring me into a new place, and so i got to really get Pharaoh to like me. And maybe also there was some self-loathing. Don't you think possibly? As he looks back and goes, My own family sold me into slavery. My dad never went to look for me. My life's been a mess ever since. And then I work so hard for this guy, and then his wife says, oh, your servant Joseph Potiphar tried to sleep with me, and so I'm mad. And then this guy that he's worked so hard for for years and years and years says, oh, I don't trust you anymore. I'm throwing you in prison. And Joseph's going, oh, I'm the worst. And then the cupbearer who interprets his dream for two years completely forgets about him. If Joseph was like me and you, there'd be a lot of reasons to say, I'm, I'm worthless. I'm nothing. And maybe this is his chance to make it all right. This is his chance to have some validation. This is his chance to get on top of the world. This is his chance to get ahead and say, okay, I'm going to be somebody. This is my moment to be somebody, to find some purpose, to be something, and he's standing before this guy with all this power, all this authority, like if anybody could have said, Joseph, you matter, and those words would mean something. It would be the words that would come from Pharaoh, the ruler of all of Egypt. But what does Joseph do? He says, I cannot do it. Would you say that with me? I cannot do it. No. He says, Pharaoh, I'm just a regular guy. I got nothing to bring to the table. I'm not going to try to get you to think I'm anything special. I can't do it. I'm just a regular guy, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. He didn't live for his own glory. He didn't point the finger back at himself. Whether driven by pride or fear or self-loathing, he said, no, I refuse to live a life 
where I try to put the attention on me. I refuse to live a life where I try to lift myself up. I refuse to live a life where I make this about me because it's not about me. I cannot do it. I'm just a regular guy. But then he does something different. He does the very thing that we have to do. At the end of the day, and we're going to talk more about this as we go, but just let me say this now. If you are driven by fear or by pride or by self-loathing, and you say, I want to be rid of that enslaving to other people, you will never be able to just quit doing that unless you replace it with something else. If you do not replace the desire to receive affirmation from other people with something else, you'll just keep on doing it. But Joseph, he says, I cannot do it. He doesn't bring glory to himself, but he replaces that with something else. You know what he does? He gives glory to God. He says, I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God, let me just point the finger towards him, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. He says, no, 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 no. It's not about me. I'm not going to let any pride well up in me. It's all God. No, 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 no. I'm not going to take this moment to point the finger to me to protect myself. It's all God. No, 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 no. Though I have some reasons maybe to feel bad about who I am, I'm not going to try to heal that wound by bringing attention to myself. I'm going to give all the glory to God. That's what he does. This is the challenge for us. If we want to be free of that, we have to decide to write a what? Where God gets the what? One more time. Decide to write a where God gets the? Now some of you are like, well, I would give God the glory if he was like having me interpret dreams for people. Because that's obviously his power. But I think I deserve the glory for what I've built. I deserve the glory for the money I've made. I deserve glory for the rock and body I put together, going to the gym every day. I deserve glory for my people skills. I deserve glory for all those things. I'm not saying you didn't work for where you are today, but do you know you would not be able to wake up with breath in your lungs if the gracious hand of God did not allow you to wake up tomorrow? At the end of the day, everything we've done, everything we've accomplished, everything we take pride in, it's all him. It's all his hand. It's all his presence. Do you think you just suddenly gave yourself all the business acumen you have, all the people skills, all the drive? All of that is a gift from God. And yes, I'm not saying you can't take any credit for it or pat yourself on the back from time to time. But at the end of the day, you could have been born somewhere else. You could have been born in a different situation. You could have been born blind or deaf. You could have been born any other way. There could have been things that shut down everything at the end of the day. God deserves all the glory. The interpretation of the dream is a miracle, but our whole lives are a miracle. So in a minute, we're going to talk about why it is best for us to give God the glory, like why it actually makes us happiest. But first, I want to say, you got to give God the glory because he deserves the glory. He is in charge. He deserves it all. We give him glory not just because it frees us from all the stuff we get stuck in, but we give him glory because he deserves all the glory, all of it. Some of you are like, well, what about me if I'm, you know, feeling bad about myself? I don't have anything I feel like I should give God glory for because I feel like I'm so low and I'm so worthless and all that. And we're going to talk more about this in just a minute. But what I'm saying is the solution to Self-loathing is not trying to raise your self-esteem. The solution to feeling like I'm a bad mom, a bad dad, a bad provider, a bad, I'm unattractive, I'm a mess, whatever. The solution to that is not trying to say, no, I'm actually a good one. The solution to that is saying, I don't have to be living up to everybody's expectations. The solution to that is to say, the point of my life is not to live into these things that I feel less than about. The point of my life is to live a life that brings him glory. Not live up to all those things, but to free ourselves from those things by living for him. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. <clears throat> Some of us may think, if I say, okay, I'm just going to live for God's glory, I'm going to have to go become a monk or something. Or even worse, a pastor. <laughs> I get that. I was there too. I don't want to be a pastor. That's the worst job in the world. I hated going to church. I hated listening, especially to preaching. I was like, please, God, not another sermon when I would go to church. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm not saying if you want to live for God's glory, it means you have to become a monk or a priest or a pastor or, you know, like sit around and sing songs all day and pray all day and all that. Sometimes we think if I do it all for God, I've got all these things I'm good at. I've got all these gifts and I'm going to stop using them because I've been using them all for my glory. And if I got to live for God's glory, well, I guess I just got to sit around and worship him, sing kumbaya, just hang out in church all day. My life is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and I like the gifts. I like the talents. I like what God has put in me, and I don't want to lose all that. What I'm saying is when you say, I'm going to write a story where God gets the glory, your life gets bigger. It gets broader. All the gifts and talents that you've been given, all the stuff that drives you now, when it gets put in the service of God, it finds meaning and fulfillment and wholeness. Look what happens next in the story. Joseph says, I can't do it, but God's going to do it. And then he interprets the dream for Pharaoh. He says, here's what the cows mean. Here's what the grain means. And what it means is that there's going to be seven years at the time of the story. I'm not saying this is not me prophesying over the church. This is what they said at the time. Joseph said there's going to be seven years of Bounty, plenty. We're all going to have all the food we need, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. That's how Joseph interprets the dream, and Pharaoh realizes it's the right interpretation. God uses Joseph in this moment. Joseph says, God, I'm going to give you all the glory. Then God uses him in this moment. But what happens next? Does he go back to the dungeon and just chill? Does he just sit on the sidelines from that moment on? Does he go and become a pastor or a priest or a, you know, just singing songs in church all day long? No, 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 no. He gets used in Egypt. He gets promoted in Egypt. Pharaoh says, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the spirit of God? Pharaoh says, Joseph is filled with God's glory. He sees it in Joseph, but then he promotes Joseph. The Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, since I see you're not some super gifted guy, you're not some brilliant guy, you're not some astrologer or enchanter, but since the spirit of God lives in you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders." Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. And the scenes end, let me switch over to this one. The scene ends right here. With Joseph giving God glory, Pharaoh giving God glory, but Joseph now with the most influence he's ever had, the most authority he's ever had, the most purpose he's ever had, saving this nation from starvation. And he builds this whole system of how they're going to save up the grain and prepare for the years of famine. He does far more giving God the glory than any of us would ever expect. What I'm saying is this. The more you live for God's glory, the more there is to your story. What do I mean the more there is to your story? I mean, the more you say, I'm gonna live for God, the more purpose there is to your story. The more life there is to your story. The more wholeness there is to your story. When you start living for God, your life does not get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You find more and more meaning, more and more fulfillment, more and more purpose because you're not living this tiny little life just focused on you, either trying to make up for the wounds of your past or trying to protect yourself or trying to have people think you're better than you are or bigger than you are or maybe as good as you are. But when you say, I'm going to live for God. You walk into something far bigger than you could have imagined. I've seen this in my life, and I'm hesitant to use this example because in my life I actually did become a pastor. That's not the point of the story is that you should become a pastor. But before I was a Christian, I was trying to um, make it in the music world. I've shared some of this story before. But I toured a little bit, and I was recording music and in all these different bands. And I'd be on stages like this, some of them smaller, some of them this side, every once in a while even a bigger one. And I was doing all that for whose glory? My glory. And I found no joy in it, no fulfillment, no meaning, no purpose. In fact, the better things went when I was trying to do music, the more fearful, the more worried, the more insecure, the more broken I became. When I found Jesus, I left all that behind. And I said, I'm done trying to be famous. I'm done with the stage. But then... I believe God, I hope it was God who called me into ministry. You hear that, God? I believe God said, hey, that thing that you were gifted to do, that you used to do for your glory, I'm going to have you do that now for, like I said, hopefully for God's glory. i got to fight that battle every single day to not make it about me. But what I'm saying is what I was doing before in terms of like being on a stage in front of people, 
Now that I'm doing it for him, oh, the worst sermon on the worst Sunday brings me more joy than the greatest concert I ever played. Do you see what I'm saying? The most lame sermon, I'm like, yeah, but that wasn't about me. It was about God, and I hope it actually touched somebody. The point, again, the point I'm not saying is whatever gifts you use in the world, you got to go work for a church and use those gifts. No, 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 no. If you're a musician and you're on tour, you can do that for the glory of God. But what I'm saying is wherever you've been using a gift or a talent or ability to point back at you, when you start using that gift or talent or ability, and it can even be a personality, it can even be working out, when you use that for God's glory, you find yourself in a life with so much more meaning so much more fulfillment, so much more joy, so much more wholeness. Amen? Amen. That's what God wants for you. And as you do it, you find yourself freed of the tyranny of self-importance, freed from the fear that drives you to self-protection, free of the enslavement to self-loathing. I want to show you how that works. I want to give you a visual demonstration. I got all these coffee mugs up here, and I want you to think of yourself like a mug. I know you can't see this from where you are, but I'm going to put them on the screen in a minute. But let me just get them out. Oh, I think I just broke one. That was crazy. All these mugs, right? As people, we get real consumed with the outside of the mug. Some of us are like, I'm the money mug. Or I gotta be the money mug. If I don't become the money mug, I'm gonna have no value, no worth. Or if I don't become the money mug, my parents will never approve of me, right? Some of us are the skills mug. I thought a video game controller might be a good (laughs) illustration of that. Some of you, that actually is something you find your identity and you're like, you would not believe if you saw me play Fortnite. Oh my gosh. That's not true for me, but that might be true for you. But this represents whatever the skill is. Coding or teaching or leadership or whatever it is. You say, I'm the skilled mug or I got to be, I got to be that skills mug. That's what I got to get to. Some of you are the smart mug. I'm not arguing. I'm just explaining why I'm right. Some of you, this is how you see yourself and you want to be seen as a smart person and you still talk about the grades you got in high school and the college you went to. And some of you feel like this is who you have to be in order to have value. Oh, I'm such an idiot and I barely graduated high school. And if I was smart, then my life would have purpose and meaning and value. Some of you are the cool mug. I thought a sloth looked kind of cool, right? Today I will do absolutely nothing. I'm chill, man. I'm cool. I'm easygoing. Or some of you are like, I'm so socially anxious and socially awkward. If I could be as chill as the sloth, then my life would have meaning and purpose and value. Some of you are the beautiful person. <laughs> we got a unicorn with dyed hair and big muscles. I tried to find something that would represent, you know, whatever part of being physically attractive would resonate with you. I thought, this gets it all in one shot. (laughs) Some of you are going, yeah, that's me. I'm so beautiful. I'm so handsome. I got the biggest biceps. And some of you are like, because I'll never have those pecs, I'm worthless. I'm never going to have a six-pack. Look at that six-pack. I'm never going to have that. You're like, oh, I'm the worst. Some of you are the Mr. or Mrs. mug. I, I tried to find like the most cliche like Christian Instagram mugs I could find. This is one Bible verse split between the Mr. mug and the Mrs. mug. It says, love is patient, love is kind, always protects it, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. Some of you are like, that's me, I'm the Mr., I'm the Mrs., and we have the perfect marriage. Or even more of us go, I feel bad about myself because I don't have the perfect Mr. Or I feel bad about myself because I don't have the perfect Mrs. Or I don't have any Mr. or any Mrs. Or the, the Mr. I have doesn't have Bible verses on his mug, let's just say that. <laughs> or the Mrs. I have, she, she, she might have the Bible verses on her mug, but she don't live out those Bible verses on her mug. And we feel bad about ourselves because we're like, I don't have the perfect marriage or I'm single or whatever. Some, it's, it's one of these for all of us, right? That's what we have all, all over here, all these different mugs, right? Some of you are going, taking pride in being one of those, and some of you feel so horrible about yourself because you're not one of them. In fact, some of you see yourself like this one, broken, chipped mug. What kind of design is that? It's like a third grader made that. What are those? Just lines and dots. You're looking at your life going, my life's nothing but lines and dots and chipped and 
I'm this busted up mug, and if I could only be the beautiful mug, if I could only be the cool mug, if I could only be the skilled mug, if I could only have the mister, if I could only have the missus, if I could only have the money, if I could only have the smarts, but as of right now, I'm just this broken, chipped mug. And we judge each other, and we fight with each other, and we point the finger, and we feel bad about ourselves, and we pump ourselves up, and we say, I would be safe if I was one of these mugs. And the point I'm trying to say is, just like mugs, what's on the outside at the end of the day doesn't really matter. You know what I care about when I wake up at 6.30 a.m. and I'm tired because I didn't get great sleep the night before and I gotta go preach at church. You know what I care about when it comes to the mug? Just whether or not it's got coffee inside. (laughs) The value of the mug comes from what's inside it. And at 6.30 in the morning, I'm not gonna go, man, this chipped mug is kinda not super attractive, but you know what? I'm just gonna hold the empty money mug because I like this mug better. No, I'm gonna choose the mug with the coffee in it. At the end of the day, that's what matters. Here's what I'm saying. If the mug has coffee in it, the outside doesn't really matter. And if the mug doesn't have coffee in it, The outside doesn't really matter. Do you see what I'm trying to say? When you say, God, I'm done living for my glory. I'm done living for me. God, I want to live for you. You know what he does? He fills you with his presence, with his power, with his spirit. I'm not saying you weren't saved before. I'm not saying you weren't loved before. But what I'm saying is Paul says, He can do greater things that we can ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. God opposes the proud, but he gives favor and lifts up the humble. And when you say, God, I'm going to do this all for you, he fills you in a different way. And when you are filled, what's on the outside does not matter. Meaning, you can be the chip mug, you can be the money mug, you can be the video game mug, you can be the smart mug, it does not matter. When you're filled with the glory of God, it puts everything else in perspective. And when you say, ah, I'm just gonna keep living for me, you're an empty mug. It doesn't matter if you got all the skills. It doesn't matter if you got all the money. It doesn't matter if you got the perfect guy or the perfect girl. It doesn't matter if you got the perfect job. It doesn't matter if you're the coolest person that's ever lived. Your life comes up empty. It amounts to nothing. The life you live for yourself is the life that you will get to the end of and regret all the accomplishments, everything you've ever built. But when you say, forget that, I don't care about any of that. I just want Jesus. I just want God. I just want to live a life for him. He fills you and you find purpose for yourself. And it's not bad to have money, like the money mug can be filled with coffee or not. The Mr. Mug, the Mrs. Mug, the skills, it doesn't matter. When you're filled with God and his presence, that's all that matters. And that's what solves all this. Self-importance, self-protection, self-loathing. How can you be prideful when you start saying, I'm gonna live for God, and you discover the power of God doing things through you. You're like, how can I take pride in the money when I'm finding God doing things, um, amazing things through me, through his power, and not just through my finances? It kills pride, but not in a way that makes you feel bad about yourself, but in a way that makes you feel good about yourself. You know that self-importance at the end of the day enslaves you. When you always have to make people like you, even if you succeed at it, you have to get more and more and more and more, and it never is enough. But when you say, I'm just gonna live for God, and he fills you, and you start doing things with his power on your side, self-importance is replaced by peace. Everybody say peace. When you are so fearful, will I get the job, will I get the person, will I get the relationship, will I accomplish those things? You're so fearful, I gotta get people to like me to protect myself. When you just give it all to God, and you find yourself filled by him, and you find him using you in day-to-day situations, that desire for self-protection is replaced by the genuine power of God. And you go, if I'm living for God, he's gonna open the doors he wants to open. If I'm living for God, he's going to bring me the person he wants me to be with when he wants me to be with that person. The desire for self-protection goes away because you discover that the actual power of God lives inside you. 
And that self-loathing, same thing, is replaced by knowing you are precious to God. Precious to God. And not in a way that says, oh, I'll have more value when I'm beautiful or cool or have the mister or the missus or become smarter or get the skills or get the money. You say, no, 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 no. I'm precious to God with this broken chipped mug that I am. The treasure is in the jars of clay. I'm precious to God because his spirit lives within me, because he made me, because he loves me, because he wants to use me. And I may stay broken and chipped until the day I die. It does not matter. I'm precious to my Savior. One more image I want to leave you with. At the end of the day, this is the goal for all of our lives right here. What's that? That's a transparent mug. That's a clear mug. I'm not saying no money, no spouses, no smarts, no skills. No, no, no. But I'm saying the goal for all of our lives should be that when people meet us, they just see God. That we live lives in a way that say, I just want to give all the glory to him. I just want to keep pointing back to him, back to him, back to him. When I'm at work, I want people to see Jesus in me. When I'm at the playground, I want people to see Jesus in me. When I'm at the gym, I want people to see Jesus in me. When I'm at church, I don't want people to see a good Christian. I want people to see Jesus in me. I don't want to bring any attention, any affirmation, any accolades, any praise, anything to me, for me. I want people to see God in me and give him the praise, him the glory, him the honor. And when you live life this way, You're freed. You're alive. You can forget all your stuff. You can forget the self-importance. You can forget the self-protection. You can forget the self-loathing because you say, I'm just a broken vessel filled with the power of God. I'm just a jar of clay filled with the treasure from Him. That's all I am and that's all I ever need to be. Amen? That's what God wants for you. Yes. Now, how do we do that? That's what you got to walk out in community, in confession, in prayer. But having that awareness is the first and biggest step. I want to challenge you to go home. Talk to somebody about what you might be wanting affirmation for. Where are you tempted to bring yourself glory? And why? Is it self-important, self-loathing, self-protection? Why, 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 why? Talk to somebody. If you're in a life group, this is where you're going to be talking about this week as you do your sermon discussion. There's another good moment to remind you, get in a life group if you're not in a life group because we walk this out together. All right, let me pray for us. God, I pray that our church would be a church of transparent mugs. I pray that we would be a church where we do not bring attention, affirmation, glory to ourselves for anything but the fact that you fill us. I pray that when people see us, they would see you. I want to now actually give a chance for anybody that does not have a relationship with Jesus to say yes to a relationship with Jesus for the first time. Maybe you're new to church. Maybe you're new to spirituality. Maybe you're new to Christianity. And you're like, I want this. I want a relationship with God. But I don't know if I have one. Becoming a Christian just means saying, God, you're my king. God, I'm going to live for your glory as best I can. When you surrender yourself to God in that way, he forgives you of all your sin, past, present, and future. If you've never made that decision to become a Christian, in just a minute, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise one hand in the air. There's nothing magical about raising a hand in the air. It's just a way for you to signify to God, God, I want to surrender to you. So now with every head bowed, everybody bow your heads. I know you're tempted to look and cheat, but keep your head bowed. Keep your eyes closed. If you want to say yes to a relationship with Jesus for the first time, I want you to put one hand in the air on the count of three. One, two, three. Put one hand up. Yes, I see that hand. I see that hand. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you can put your hands down. All right, prayer team, you can come forward. We're going to do what we did last week as well. If you just raised your hand, do not leave this place without coming down and talking to somebody on the prayer team. Prayer team, you can come down right now. Do not leave this place. I don't want to just lead you through a prayer that you're not going to understand and then leave this place thinking you figured something out that you haven't figured out yet. 
come down after the service and talk to somebody on the prayer team. If you need prayer for anything else going on in your life, come down as well. These people would love to pray for you. If you just raised your hand and you walked down after the service to talk to somebody here, people aren't going to know whether you raised your hand or whether you just wanted prayer for something else, right? So your, your cover will not be blown if you feel self-conscious that you just became a Christian for the first time. So all of us come down who needs prayer or who just raised their hand. If you're new, we'd love to see you in the five-minute meetup. If you need prayer, like I said, come down and we'll see you next week for the conclusion of our series, Windy. God bless and have a great day. Love you all.